Thank you, Ewhoa. I guess let's just start right back at the beginning with a whakaaro. Um, you know, in, in your opinion, with all your reading and the kōrero tuku iho and stuff, what do you think the purpose of the war on Waikato Tainui was? I think if we look at the bigger picture in terms of the intention of the British at that time, um, I would contend that the purpose was to consolidate the power and authority of the British Empire uh, on this part of Aotearoa New Zealand. And of course there are a number of barriers um, to that being uh, realised. You often talk about the doctrine of discovery along with um, and say it's important when we talk about the war on the Waikato, on Waikato and Tainui that we look uh, back into history. Uh, can you just, you know, sh uh, without going back too far, just give us a little bit of a background of where you think uh, the motivation for war came from? I think we need to contextualise our history Waikato invasion of the Waikato invasion of the Kingitanga into uh, the broader context of not only the treaty conversation or the, the Whakaputanga or New Tirini conversation but into even a more wider global uh, conversation and framework and context and it started of course in my limited and unqualified view with the doctrine of discovery with the four, five, six, seven papal bulls, which uh, one after another enshrined within that institution uh, a certain worldview, uh, a certain set of norms, uh, which were based on a um, twisted sense of um, arrogance and white privilege, um, and used religion to justify um, essentially uh, imperialism, empire building, the taking over of people's lands, their natural resources, their wealth. It also um, justified slavery, um, ethnocide, genocide. So if we look back to what the doctrine of discovery, what its intention was, uh, the intent was to Christianise the world. So those who were outside of the faith, uh, for want of another word, uh, were uh, to be seen as infidels, which included, of course, the Saracens or the Muslim people and everyone outside of the Catholic faith. They were to be seen as lesser than those who were Catholic or Christian at that time, and they were to be treated lesser. Their uh, resources were uh, basically to be put up for grabs on the open market. Their lands were to be um, taken over, and their children to be, for want of another, another word, enslaved. Um, all in the name of the faith. Now, way back then, and this is, um, we're talking about just prior to the reign of Henry VIII in England, and uh, for those of us who know what Henry did, he married several times, and the Pope obviously said no uh, to the divorce, and so he established the Church of England. Now, by then, these edicts, these papal bulls had already been Exposed is this sort of world view, this stereotyping already entrenched amongst the European elites. So we have countries like Spain, Portugal, England, and uh, the Dutch via the Dutch East India Company. These were states that uh, were superpowers when it came to colonisation. And what they all had in common is that they were all, prior to Henry, they were all Catholic, and the um, influence of the papal bulls um, were quite significant. 
in justifying their imperial activity and their empire building. So that allows us to come ahead quite a number of years. Um, I think 1802, if I remember correctly, I stand to be corrected, our dear friend in the um, English Parliament, his name was Lord William Wilberforce. Um, after 20 years of struggle, he was able to get his bill passed in Parliament. Now that bill was the uh, abolition of slavery across the British Empire. That was in 1802, I believe it was passed. Now, had our friend, who very few of us know, not been successful in passing that particular bill, it would have been probable that when the English came, they came with a very different intent. Well, maybe not the intent, but a different mechanism in terms of their imperial and empire building process. Lucky for us, um, slavery was outlawed by the British Parliament. And lucky for us, our people now, we are not um, descendants of those who were enslaved physically. But I think it's a lot more complex than that. Constitutionally and legally, I believe that we have been enslaved. Um, so one way or another, we are still dealing with the effects of British Empire building and colonialism. So the question, coming back to the question, the intent of the war in the Waikato was the same as the intent of the war in Taranaki, the same with the intent of the war in the north, on the east coast, south of the North Island, Maunga Pohatu. It's the same. When we come to New Zealand following that history, we know um, we had the arrival of missionaries, both missionaries uh, here, and then the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. And if we fast forward to 1860s, when we're in this position, um, we're actually 1850, late 1850s, we Porta Tau Te Whero Whero, and then Kingi Tawhiao, mm. who were, uh, had a belief that, you know, Te Triti or Waitangi was going to protect them and their lands. What, what do you imagine um, the Crown position was given the treaty had been signed just a couple of decades before? It's difficult. <clears throat> I mean, the question, the difficulty comes in trying to identify who the Crown is. Mm, for me, a descendant of someone who signed the treaty, my definition of the Crown is that she sits in England. Um, when we have the establishment of a colonial government and we have um, the term Crown now being used to identify um, members of a New Zealand Parliament who are in fact a third party in a process, then complexities begin to arise. And um, the word crown is now nowadays referred to more um, parliament in New Zealand and the, um, the executive branch and all of that constitutional arrangements which um, are part of our modern day life. Where do you think the headspace of those colonial soldiers under Governor Grey were given the Treaty of Waitangi had just been signed a few decades before? Hmm. Well, again, I think there's a difficulty because there are those who are pushing for the treaty with good intention um, and the colonial officers' intentions who were to maintain the integrity of and the mana of the Queen, Queen Victoria and her successors. But the problem was there were intermediaries, there were business interests, uh, there were religious interests behind the scenes uh, manipulating and, and um, conniving to do something different than what the intention of the treaty clearly was. Then we had on top of that a judiciary, a legal system, which really at the time was not one that was structured or designed to deal with two parties, 
to a treaty. So already there's complexities emerging in that process. I think um, maybe there are those who were Crown members of Parliament who had good intentions and those who, who did not or had ulterior intentions. And I think history speaks to more to the latter rather than the former. I wonder if we could talk about some of the, um, the characters who were, you know, our tūpuna. Um, and maybe I'll start with um, Rewi Maniopoto, Po Tūpuna. Can you describe Rewi Maniopoto to us? Um, kia mātou i kuna i te kāinga. Uh, ko te ingoa karangatia nei uh, ko manga, manga, manga Maniopoto. So when we speak about him, uh, we, we use the term manga as opposed to rewi, but that was his um, Anglicanised name, rewi. Um, and, uh, you know, I have to be honest, um, what I say is merely a view. Um, I wasn't around back then, but what I've heard from our old people was that he was definitely different. Two things, um, I think, which contributed to his uniqueness and his character. One was his Pākehā education at uh, Te Kōpua Missionary School. So he was educated um, formally in a Pākehā way, which none of his tūpuna before him ever were. He could write. He could begin to think, rationalise things from a, a Pākehā perspective because he was taught and on the other side, of course, was his um, Ngāti Paratakoa uh, Matuas, who have a history of being involved in peacekeeping for the tribe. And um, so he received both a traditional and a contemporary education. Um, and obviously, that sets him somewhat aside from his... Um, contemporaries, his cousins and his uncles and aunties of the time. So it's clear looking back, I think, that he was a person who made decisions, but as new information came to light, could change his position. Because information and decision making is based on the best information at hand. And if that information is outdated, new information comes forth, then you change according to the information you have. So he was very flexible. And I think history shows that how a number of times he changed positions because of new information. Um, he wasn't a big, physically, he was not like his cousin, Wahanui, who was a big, um, big man. Um, Manga was quite small, um, rugged, at the age of 14, he had already been blooded in battle. Um, so he knew, I guess, the cold facts of war. And I'm not trying to paint war on a positive note. I mean, he knew the price of war. He knew the, the look and the feel of blood. He knew what it was like to go to war hand to hand and to take people's lives and, you know, and to see all of that on the, on the battlefield. So he wasn't a person that was a politician by trade. Um, he grew up in a time when there was a lot of war. His father and his grandfather were involved in many, many campaigns. So he came from that reality. He was um, taught at uh, Te Kōpua School got a new level of um, thinking, uh, exposed to new ideas, a different way of looking at the world. He began to understand the Pākehā mindset. So from that point of view, um, definitely a man of his time. There's a lot said about his relationship with uh, Wirimu Tamihana. Um, Maybe you have in, you could share anything there, or if you can't, then could you tell me what you know about Wirimu Tamihana? Ah, oh, Wirimu Tamihana, that comes down from Te Waharoa. 
a very, very noble lineage within Tainui. Um, um, at that time, obviously, Wirimui Tamaha was quite an influential man, um, being the one who crowned uh, our, the king, uh, being a Christian, a devout Christian man of the Bible, uh, being leader of his of his iwi hapu, and very influential in the Waikato uh, political forum, peacemaker, a strategist, a um, a man of great courage and great dignity and mana. I, the connection I know is that within the king's council, and I think Manga sat on two of the king's council, Portato's council and his son Tafio. So he sat on those two councils for the two kings. I do know that at times there were um, differences of views between Manga and his contemporaries and sometimes differences of views with um, Wirimu Tamihana on matters but that in no way did that complicate or undermine the commitment to the concept and notion of mana Māori motuhake. Most times they agreed uh, as an example, just prior to the Battle of Orako, uh, three, four weeks prior, a great um, council was held amongst Manuputo. It was around Whareapapa South somewhere. And that council agreed that Rewi is to continue his command position of the um, defence forces, that he was to go and see Wirimu Tamihana and together um, establish a, uh, a defensive plan for the final phase of the, of the invasion of the Waikato. Um, we do know that after that meeting, uh, of course our Tupuna was living at Waikiri at the time, on his way to go and see his colleague and, um, and friend, that they came upon a group from Tuhoe and Rokawa who had been encamped at Tiaratitaha on this side of uh, Maunga Tautari. And Manga's job was to go and see Wirimu Tamihana on the other side of Maunga Tautari to establish an, a systemised uh, defensive plan or uh, a, a counter plan. That never happened. The rest is history. So I think there were tensions sometimes, but overall the relationship with Wirimu Tamaha was definitely uh, one of positive um, relationships because they both believed firmly in the notion of Tamana Māori motuhake. Before we come to Orako, which we will shortly, I just wanted, we, we were at Rangiao Fair yesterday um, and, and speaking with Rahui, not with our Papa Tom just yet, but understanding um, a little bit more around Wirimu Tamihana's uh, reaction, I guess because he was a man of God, mm. um, to what happened there at Rangiao Fair. Um, you know, you talk about him being a mad man of God and, and there's, there's, there's a number of stories around the missionaries at Rangiaofia. I mean, it, when you read his letters and, you know, hear the stories, what do you think must have gone through his head, you know, following what had happened mm -hmm. out there, the killing of women and children? I'm not sure what went through, but, you know, if I was in that situation, I would certainly be shaken. My faith would be shaken. I would have been sh shaken because the basic tenets on which your faith is built and to know that um, there were men of faith taking part in that particular massacre, <clears throat> as we do call it a pahuatanga, mm -hmm. um, not an incident or engagement, but a pahuatanga massacre of Rangiaofia, that <clears throat> um, not only were men of faith there, that it was a Sunday and 
the people were in, were at Karakia. And um, I think Wiremu Tamaha, Tamahana would have been absolutely devastated to know that that's what happened to his people who are people of faith. Did it change things for you know, those who believed in, in, in the faith and God for the people of Maniapoto who were involved in those churches? Did it change things? I think there would have certainly been some deep, deep ref reflections on what does this mean. We, you know, so much trust was given to the clergy and to have them involved, even though it's from the sideline, observing, certainly not stopping what was happening. I think it certainly would have caused our people a lot of angst, anxiety, and would have caused them to rethink the, you know, the foundations of their, of their faith. Following, you know, the Pahuatanga, following Orako and the confiscation of land, you know, um, there were Māori faiths that did pop up, uh, Pai mm. Māori then. Do That's you think right. this, what, you know, do you think that was a mm. reaction to what had happened? The mistrust of the sure. missionaries in those days? <clears throat> I think it's absolutely highly probable and, pro and definitely um, if you think about what happened during the wars, absolutely, for me, it, it would have shaken my faith had I been a person of faith. Um, so the fact that we have the emergence of the Pai Marere from Taranaki brought down uh, to Waikato by King Tafio and they've been entrenched as the king's religion. Uh, we have um, other faiths that have emerged um, and I think it is a response to acknowledging that what was brought here, maybe the integrity really wasn't there. And so our people, as we do, we are very um, creative and innovative. We'll find something different and we'll create something of our own that reflects who we are and our, our space in the world and that supports our norms and um, our worldview. Following um, the Pahuatanga at Rangiaufia, um, what happened next in terms of the war? Where did they come next? Was it Orako straight away? Uh, Haidini, Rangiaufia, Haidini, Orako. Obviously, after Rangiaufia, there are a lot of emotions running very high. Um, all of the Kingitanga uh, people heard what had happened, and all of those along the coast as well, because uh, you have the connection there with um, our people from the east coast. Um, these are the uh, people from Matatua who were implicated through the actions of um, Faulkner and his so called um, murderer to the wide ramifications from Rangiaufia. So from Rangiaufia, Cameron was moving his troops and our people really needed to vent, I believe, themselves and do something quite significant. So a stand was made at um, Haidini, which is not too far from Orako. It's between Kihikihi and Te Omutu. Um it wasn't very well thought through. A lot of our people were wounded, a number of them shot. And in fact, um, Munga's brother was wounded there at Haidini. Um, a few years later, he died from his wounds. So it was a, a, um, an opportunistic attempt to, I think, let off steam and to show the colonial forces that what they had done was not um, Acceptable. So Orako, was it ready? Orako was never ever a part of any battle plan or any defensive strategy at all. <coughs> so orders had been given, a mis the mission was to go and see, uh, a link up with Wirimu Tamihana, uh, make a, a, a plan for phase two or the last phase of the defence. And on the way there, <coughs> on the way across Maungatotari to ensure that we've got as much 
relevant information as possible, like any field commander would do. You'd send out um, reconnaissance groups to go and gather information on the enemy's disposition, on their weapons and on their uh, morale, how they're located, what are they doing. And then you'd take that information with you, you'd sit down with your co-commander to draft your plan. On the way there at Te Aratitaha, um, there we received, Manga received word that a group, a large contingent from uh, Tuhue, um, Tuwharetua and Rokoa Te Kohera had gathered at Te Aratitaha and were wanting to engage with him and um, to discuss um, some important matters. So <clears throat> he went there uh, to meet with um, his allies, because they were his allies. And you have to understand that a part of them being there was because of himself, him and his cousin, um, Tawini Tana Tupo Tahi, early on, um, prior to the breakout of, of war in the southern part of the Waikato, we actually in Tuhoe, gathering up um, support for the war. So they had come over. Um, and they really wanted to engage directly with the troops. They didn't want to take their weapons back all the way to Tuhe without being fired. Um, Te Pairato was there from Ngāti Tukuhera. He was adamant that uh, if, if... Well, he was adamant that this is the time and the place. So the emotions um, were quite strong that an engagement should be taken very soon. Um, their decision and idea was to do so at Orako. Um, Manga's view was totally opposite. You have to understand why that's the case. This is his land. He knows the lay of the land. He knows where the good places are and the not good places. Are. Yeah. You know, he is living at Waikaria. So all of the lands around here, these fall within his mana. He knows the land. First thing. Um, second thing is that it wasn't his mission. He was determined to meet with Winimu Tamihana and to do something um, less opportunistic but more systematic. That didn't happen, so he was put in a, in a bit of a catch-22 situation. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Um, uh, Tuhoi had um, a number of um, matakite with them. They brought with them seers. Um, to help with their decision making and they had said that the seers had seen you know great things to happen uh, it's going to be a great war uh, we're going to win this particular engagement uh, Manga did not believe that one cent and, and actually he sung um, he sung a mutter to them saying that um, great disasters will come and I'll be the only one walking out of this. But uh, they were insistent that they should fight, and they decided that it would be at Orako. So Manga being the most senior commander there. And the thing is, you know, in a command situation, um, if it's your people, you have total command over them. But where these are outside people, they come with their own commanders. And they will only listen to their own commander. Mm. So there's this sort of political tensions going on. And um, cut a long story short, he said, well, we shall see. And so, you know, they began building uh, a pa mayoro, it's called, which is a fortified earth defensive position at Orako. Major problem with that, of course. Um, access to fresh water, a timeliness between the beginning of the construction of the fortification to its absolute completion. And the problem with that is the British troops, or the colonial and imperial troops, arrived on the scene before the power was finished. So not only was the power not finished, uh, the logistical situation 
was absolutely dire because they hadn't um, been able to secure um, sufficient ammunition, two, absolutely insufficient water. The only food they had were potatoes and kumara, pumpkins, and the peaches from the peach trees. I can't even remember if it's actually in the season, but very little kai. So your ability to withstand a, a multi-day um, siege is very limited. Coupled with that, the tactical situation on the ground, the way the ground falls, uh, its terrain, it opens itself up to being surrounded quite easily. So unfortunately, all of these lemons came into, <laughs> came into a feat where they all came together to create a disastrous tactical situation for uh, the commander to be in. Now you overlay with that the fact that probably a third of your people that you're responsible for are men and women. That even creates a more complicated situation. What happened? What was, in my view, a an absolutely unwinnable situation where I believe the English commanders and officers thought that no one would come out of this alive. The Māori defenders would not walk out of this alive. I think due to good generalship um, of the over 300 that were in the in the par, um, over a third of them came out with their lives still intact, although somewhat beaten and battered and injured. See, there are discrepancies in the numbers, but like um, Rangiao fear. You say that they had little resource and ammunition. What did they use? They, they did had they, they had some ammunition that was with them. So in all, because it was a three-day siege, um, a lot of the engagements were one day, you know, context, boom, finish, two days, boom, this is a three-day siege. So what they had to do is to ensure the little ammunition they had would last at least as long as possible. So um, the uh, Director of Innovation and Creativity thought, wow, why don't we use the peach the um, the inner core of the peach, and that and use that, and construct it, and and at least we could pretend that we still have ammunition and fire those at the enemy. It's a bit of an innovation there. Uh, the ru it was a ruse just to keep up a perception that the defensive force still had ammunition, when in fact there was very little in the power itself. So the symbol of the peach tree is actually quite an interesting one when we talk about Orako. Because Orako as a power was actually situated amongst peach trees, the peach tree grove. Tēra kōrero, ka whawhai tōnu mātou, ake, ake, ake. Uh, ka tāri koe te whakamāruma, nā wai tēra kōrero. So who, who said it, where and what part of the battle was it said and what became of it? Well. The day the general arrived on the scene, General Cameron, um, the battle was almost at the end. They'd been fighting already for a number of days. So the f one of the first things that Cameron did, of course, was send out his emissary to go and treat for peace. Well, surrender, actually. Let's get it right. And... Um, so he carried the general's message to the defensive force and the response came from the pa, the formal response came from the pa. Now I think um, there are views on who said that. 
but at the end of the day, it's irrelevant because there's only one commander on the scene. And what comes from the defensive position is the word of the commander. And so as far as we are, we are concerned, that came from Manga through his intermediaries, whoever they may be, that's irrelevant. And it symbolised the determination, uh, not only his, but of Māori people, you know. It symbolises something better than just the words themselves. And if we look at this whole notion of um, British colonialism and empire building being a global phenomenon as it was at that time and still is today um, although in a slightly different form if we look at that term what does that mean uh, back then it meant you know we are physically at war with you and we will not surrender I think if we look at that term now for me it's really about yes that is a legacy that's handed down. It is a legacy entrenched in the notion of struggle, uh, struggle for uh, your rights, struggle for the treaty, for the whakaputanga, but struggle for your humanity. And today it's really, the battle is not a physical battle, it's really a political battle and for our people, it's, it's a cry, it's a battle cry. It's all about continuing that campaign and that, that struggle to ensure that our grandchildren will no longer have to contend with being slaves, uh, constitutional slaves, um, legislative slaves of a regime that is not of our making that does not represent who we are, that does not articulate our dreams and aspirations into the future, and that is a struggle for our freedom, and it's an ongoing struggle. The Battle of Orako lasted three days. We're talking some 300 defenders versus 1,400 or so attackers. Mm. What does that say about uh, those whānau there at Orako? You know, I think it tells a lot about the spirit of our people, actually, that um, when the tide is high, when everything is against you, when you are all the odds that there are, are stacked against you, that our people have this deep sense of resilience, perseverance and determination. And I guess, for me, Wadako is really all about values. It is a conflict. It is a, a point in time in history but the enduring story of Orako is the values which underpin the narrative. And, you know, we talk about courage. We talk about selflessness. We talk about compassion, determination, perseverance, integrity, honour. These things, to me, represent what Orako is about. They also, to me, represent what's best in our people. So Orako is, is a legacy of resilience and resistance. Today, COVID-19, we are a resilient people. Following that battle, uh, after the three days, how, what happened then? How did it end? Well, um, our people on the last day, two, three o'clock in the afternoon. They made a break through the defensive lines. They moved um, in disciplined fashion. They did not run screaming and yelling. They were very disciplined in their uh, retreat. 
So they made their way, they broke through um, the lines to the south of, of the position. It's a five kilometer walk to the Punya River. And it is in that, over that um, five kilometers that many of our people, collectively, our people were killed. Um, the cavalry, the um, the forest rangers, um, all of the units within the imperial and colonial forces did their very best on those five kilometres to diminish the number of um, survivors that would finally make their way across the Punya River to safety. Um, and it's in that retreat that our own Tupuna um, and his son were killed, um, along with many others. So they crossed the Punya River, what survivors they could, across the Punya River. Some waited till middle of the night or early the next morning to cross, they hid, made their way south. Some went into Otewa, some went to other paths in, in Manipoto to seek respite, to get their wounds attended to. And finally, those who were left from Tuhoe, from Te Kohera, from Tuwhare Toa, from Kahanganu, from Ngāti Whare, and the other tribes, slowly began to make their way home, long journey home. For our Manipoto people, we retreated further back into Tenehenehenui to Rohepotai, because at that time, uh, most of Waikato had mobilised south, and we had t to ensure that as a tribe, Manipoto, uh, we're in a position to uh, give refuge to over 12,000 Waikato people who had moved from, had been forced off their lands in the north. Uh, they needed to be looked after, to be housed, to be fed, to be given a home. So that was the next big important kaupapa to address and that Manipoto needed to take care of our kin from the north. And it happened over a 10, 12 year period. It must be extremely tough times. Very, very tough times. If you look at, you know, situation then, um, Manipoto in the hinterland, uplands of the central king country, there's not too much big, long um, flats where you could grow lots of kaias in the Waikato. Very different terrain. So the challenges were very difficult for Manyaputo, um to ensure that they were looking after um, their kin from the north. Tough times by all. Um, but again, you know, resilience, perseverance. Um, Waikato were finally allowed to return home, but that's after a long, long period living in um, someone else's home. When you consider that story, um, the fact that uh, everyone was referred to as rebels because they wouldn't cede to the Queen and to the colonial forces and that, and the suffering, the confiscation of lands and then the next part for Maniapoto, which was the you know legislative confiscation, if you like, of mm. land. What do you think the impact of the war on Waikato Tainui has been? I think the impact for Waikato has been significant, um, mm. huge. Um, you know, culturally, spiritually, physically, intergenerationally. Um, hugely traumatic and there's no word other than trauma you know a tribe is traumatized, uh, traumatized by what happened because when you no longer have access to your natural resources you once did you no longer have the authority to make decisions for yourself you are expected to abide by rules which are not of your making the schools you go to are not your schools um, 
everything is foreign. And that is, you know, that's huge problems. Um, I think a lot of New Zealanders generally have no idea of how difficult, problematic um, that time was for Waikato Tainui and continues to be. Um, settlements are a transactional process. They are not a healing process. When you drive around this lush countryside of Maniapoto and Waikato and you see the land that's gone and now in farmland, you know, as somebody who knows the stories of the history of this land, what's that like for you? Mm. I think for me it's just a matter of being um, understanding um, reality for what it is and how it presents itself. Um, I'd prefer that all of this land that you see around us here was still our Tupuna's land, but it's not. It was taken through the Public Works Act, not through confiscation, as you rightly say. The Crown used a different mechanism against Maniaputo. And just here, just around us, the 10,000 acre block, known as the Tokanui block, was one of the first to go under Public Works Act within the side of the Aukati, which is the King Country. 10,000 acres was taken, justified for a reformatory farm and a mental hospital. So, you know, 5,000 each maybe. It's a pretty big prison, pretty big mental hospital. You think that's punishment? For of course it is. There's no question about that at all. In fact, I've seen evidence of it. Uh, I've seen the original maps where the surveyors um, had names of soldiers on the blocks that were going to be partitioned off after the 10,000 acre block was carved out by the Mar Native Land Court at the time. Is there an irony now in, in the fact that they confiscated this land around you, so close to Oraco, to Rangiaufia, mm -hmm. and now we have the imprisonment, the, you know, one of the mm -hmm. largest prisons in the country with over 51% Māori that are accommodated? Um, I'm not surprised. Um, it is the modus operandi of the coloniser you know, to punish those who will stand against you. So for our people here, um, Ngāti Puretakoa, who were um, very active during the Waikato War, um, we understand that this is the punishment for doing what we did. And, but we also understand that we are resilient and that we will wait and we will bide our time and we'll have a plan to ensure that what was taken is returned. What would you like, um, you know, Pākehā New Zealanders who live here mm -hmm. around on the whenua of Paritekawa mm -hmm. or even just in the Waikato, Tainui or even just in Aotearoa, what would you like them to take away from these stories? I'd like... Um, Mid New Zealanders to understand and to appreciate the fact that New Zealand's economy as it currently exists was built on the backs of our tupuna and that the fundamental political, religious, social freedoms that exist and that they enjoy are enjoyed because of others and the suffering that others have had to endure and continue to endure, they need to be appreciative of that and show that and understand that. What does it mean to you as someone who's from Ngāti Maniopoto to live with this history, the mamai of it, the impact? Mm. Being informed comes at a price. And when you know the history of um, your people and the suffering that they've not only endured a hundred years ago or more, but continue to endure, um, it's very painful. Um, it is a bit of a burden, you know, to carry. 
but at the same time, we have to balance it out with being, having an optimistic view that in knowing this information and understanding this history, um, I, there is an obligation to do something about it, to try and balance the ledger and balance the book, so to speak, to ensure that there is justice not only seen to be done, but is actually done and done in a way where um, there is no residual negative um, feelings, but rather releasing yourself from that past, you know, in a positive way that's constructive and that's transformative. That's really important. And I guess in many ways my involvement in this space is because of that view. And possibly also because of your name that you can <laughs> never forget. I was wondering if you'd share that with us. It's okay sure. if you would. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, 1999, I travelled to Canada and stayed in the Haudenosaunee people, the Confederacy of the Six Nations, uh, at a place called Oneida which is um, just out of uh, Toronto by a couple of hours. My role there was to do some research on treaty settlements in and also to, in particular to look at the, that people's um, constitutional arrangements, which were about 700 years old and still, still uh, very much in place. So I stayed there for some time and prior to my departing, I was called into a special ceremony by the, uh, the elders there and given a, a First Nations name, uh, which is their custom, it's their tikanga, their kawa. So I came home back here to Ngāti Paritikawa and spoke to all my queers and told of my trip and the fact that they had given me a name and I was wanting to register myself under that name because it had meaning for me. Mm. You know, it had some significance, it symbolised something really important in my life. So um, they said, oh, what's your Māori name? I said, I don't have one. But, oh, oh, no, 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 never ever to take that name, oh, we're going to give you a name. So after about a month or two, I got called, summonsed back to the, to the queers, my, my mum's elder cousins. And they said, we've got your name, and this is your name, Kafia Timurahi. You will carry that name. You will not go and adopt some strange foreign name. <laughs> mm. So that was in 19, you know, 2000, end, you know, on the turn of that 2000 period. Um, so the name Kafia is, my, also is a tupuna name. My mother's brother's name was Kafia. And our Tupuna's name, which is Zewi's father, his name was also Kafia. So you, that's where the names come from. Mm. Um, it has some meaning. Thank you for raising that. I never thought of that. Mm. Uh, in particular, I was interested in the tu, uh, Murahi. And the Murahi the, name? The, the origin of that. I think we talked about that in our uh, first interview. So uh, during the uh, retreat from the, the Pa, uh, Paul Neki and his son Nikiti, who are my tupuna, our tupuna, uh, they were with the formation uh, as it was traversing that five kilometre uh, track prior to it breaking up into smaller groups. And Nikiti, the son, um, he was shot, he fell back was wounds, he couldn't get up and walk and continue to move forward. His father, Paul Neke, who was in the formation, saw his son fall. So he pulled back and went to, to his son. And he could see him bleeding and there's nothing much else that he could do for him. The cavalry and the soldiers were advancing at some pace and he knew that you know, um, there's no way out for him. So Pōneke began to sing his Puruparaki to his son and they were both killed there. Now, the story comes through a, an eyewitness 
on my other side, my Tehuya Fano side, Tufukatote. Luckily, young Nikiti had a son at the time of the war, of the battle. He would have been about eight to ten years old, and his name was Remy. So, a number of years after the battle, Remy's Tupuna Rewi called him in and he changed his name from Remy Poneke to Temurahi. Um, in memory of the battle and Temura Oteahi, where they fell, his parents fell. Those who fled, mm. um, how were they? you know, shot down, you know, what were the stories about them? I think, I recall, a, a, you know, there was, people had written to the Te Awamatu papers back in the day, and I thought there were some recordings about, you know, um, bodies that had been left in the Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah there yeah. were. Yeah, so uh, maybe if you could talk to us, yeah, some of those people who fell in the Orako battle, what was the story about how they died? There is, um, <coughs> After the war, sometime after, a lot of soldiers, uh, I understand, um, wrote into the newspapers um, informing them what they had seen. And, um, and referred to it as a massacre, because children, young children were seen, women were seen, killed. Bodies were left in the open. And in fact, when they went to bury, finally got around to burying many of those tupuna who lay there on the battlefield, they were stripped of their clothes and put into mass graves, highly indignant um, burials at that time. Um, there is records that if some of the prisoners who were taken from, um, from the battle were taken back to garrison, soldiers raped, and one in particular was killed and her name was um, this is a tupuna of a sad but his tupuna this is the late now um, speak of the house from Tarawa um, the late great doctor Peter Tapsell's tupuna she was killed um, by the troops as a prisoner of war When you look at it, the majority of the troops and those in command of the troops, uh, by their actions, you understood what was in their minds, you know, that they did not see our people as equals at all and treated them less than equals. Got it. 